stuff in store for you. But first, you've got some stuff in store for me. And I'm going to pick people at random, totally up to my internally generated intuitions, which means you're at the mercy of the wind. <laughs> now, some of you may pray for guidance, but that would be wind worship. <laughs> We've gone through all kinds of stuff this weekend. And some of you have gone through some stuff that was scary to you, and you've gone through some stuff that was unscary for you, and some stuff that was interesting, and some stuff that was dreary, and you've gone through some stuff that you think was strange, and some stuff that you thought was flat out nuts. And you were right. It was all of those things, and there were some other things too. I want to pick a few people at random, and you don't have to come up, I'm just going to ask you one question. The question is this. Tomorrow, during the day when I'm sleeping in, <laughs> oh, I'm going to be sleeping in, I'm tired. You're so draining and demanding and wonderful and just great. I'm going to sleep in at least till nine. Till <laughs> wow. nine. I'm going to go to bed at like 7.15 and get up at nine. <laughs> you're going to have to ask yourself this question. What do I do now? Right? And that's the question, boy, I've learned a lot, I've heard a lot, and I'm going to learn some more Monday night and Tuesday night. What do I do now? And here's what you're going to do. You're going to enter a communication with someone else. You're going to meet someone you don't know. You're going to meet somebody you do know, and you're going to say, I wonder if I could try one of these techniques Michael showed you. Would this be totally unfair with this person that I care about? <coughs> I'd ask you this. If you could find a better way of reaching out and sharing with someone you love them, would you do it? If you could find a better way of earning a living and making yourself happy, would you do it? There's nothing artificial about wanting to learn how to communicate as well as you can, whether it's by enunciating your words, learning another language, or using intellectual judo, or politically cross-dressing it, or using a representational system that someone saw talking with their visual, auditory, or These are all important elements. But tomorrow you're going to say, well, what do I do? You're going to do three things. First, when you meet somebody, you're going to know what kind of outcome you want. That's the most important thing you can do as a communicator. What? results do I want? What do I want to happen from this encounter? Second, you're going to vary your behavior because you're the independent variable. And third, you're going to have enough sensory awareness to know when you got the results you want. And when you do those things, you're going to use all these different techniques. You're going to try political cross-dressing with this person and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. You know what you're going to do if it works? You're going to thank them for showing insight and thoughtfulness. You know what you're going to do if it doesn't work? Anything else. And then if that second thing doesn't work, what are you going to do? Anything else. And if the third thing doesn't work, what are you going to do? Anything else. And if that works, what are you going to do? You're going to take yes for an answer. A lot of people can't take no for an answer. Pro freedom people can't take yes for an answer. Someone says, I agree with you. Well, let me explain to you why you agree with me. <laughs> you don't need to explain why you agree with me. I accept the fact that you've shown intelligence and wisdom. You don't have to explain that. And you're going to have that happen to you in the course of the next week, the next month, the next year. Sometime in the next month, you're going to think of something and go, wow, I wonder if that would work here. And you're going to try it out. And what are you going to do if it doesn't work? Anything else. And what are you going to do if that doesn't work? Anything else. And as you keep trying different things, what's going to happen? You're going to find what works and what doesn't, where it works and where it doesn't. That's called scientific. It's called experimental. It's called reasonable. You've picked out a lot of things in the course of the weekend. And what I'd like to do is pick at random and ask you what one thing you found out either about yourself or about persuasive skills that you'd like to use tomorrow. What one thing would you like to use tomorrow? Uh, regarding what? <laughs> 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 sure. 
regarding persuading someone, what one thing that you learned here would you like to use? Well, I like the arguing technique. Uh, arguing with the non-communicating techniques. All right, you could use some of those. How about somebody shot, quiet? What would you like to do? Um, I don't know. Um, well, everything is so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, so I can't say which one of them. Then I will give you instructions. You're to be a gourmet cook and use it all. <laughs> All right. <Yay>. Martin. <laughs> you reminded me just when I was here that when I laugh at myself, I make it easier for others to laugh with me and talk with me because they don't feel intimidated, they don't feel threatened. You know, that obviously if I don't always take myself quite as seriously as, as I might other times, then there's an opportunity for them to enjoy the conversation and, and enjoy it for a conversation and not feel like they're going to get pressured or lectured or anything like that. Um, what one thing do you think you might be able to use? <laughs> you, sir. Well, I think you may be based up for the fact that I have a tendency to meet force with force. Uh, that's my way of thinking, too. And uh, I think there are better ways of doing it, and I believe that you've thought of stuff. And I, I feel that I've gained something that way. What about you? You were ready to say something. I know you've got a thought in your mind. I wonder if Brian's just using that technique of watching the eyes to find out the side of their mind to find out what's going on. That's wonderful. What a wonderful way to figure out how to understand it. Tom, how about you? Well, I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to think of something that I can use to you want to drive the point home and then you want to turn around and say that you're right. And, and I know that I do that a lot. Like you drive the things you think are, are the best thing to home to these people and it is and all those experiences. And uh, I think I'll uh, definitely listen a little bit more to what they're asking. And um, instead of arguing and turning away and saying, yep, I'm right there, done, I think I'll try to use a couple of those techniques to see if it works. Two things. One, to be more aware of exactly <coughs> how I'm talking and what expressions I'm using in my posture and gestures and that. But another thing that uh, I think is very useful is the technique of showing the person that, or telling them that you have basically the same goal. What are the fundamental goals here? The fundamental goal is not a government program, but rather to solve a particular problem. And we agree on that level. And I think that really disarms an opponent when they realize that you're really after the same good things and the same good society that, that they are after. And it's, uh, you have a better way to do it. All right. Or you have a friend who has a better way of doing it. Maybe <laughs> one. <laughs> yes. One thing I've really learned that I think is very useful is about picking up on and and using the other person's representational language, whether it's visual or auditory or tactile. Because it's, so, it's something that I, I never even thought about before. And it's, it's so obvious when you do think about it that if, that if, if they use any one of those as a dominant role, as a dominant communication method, that if you got, you got to get on the same. You got to get on their wavelength, and that's that's the best way to do it. Let's try some stuff. Mm -hmm. fun. I always like to go out with a bang, not a whimper. <laughs> that's better on dates too. Admit <laughs> 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 it. You would have thought of it too, wouldn't you? And you were going to use it tomorrow, and you're not going to give me credit. <laughs> That always bothers me. You tell a joke, everybody groans at it, and the next day they're telling it. <laughs> no foot, no. No foot, no. You know, one of the problems we have when we recommend freedom is exactly what you mentioned. So we have a tendency to set up our own agenda and tell them what's important to them. You see, as advocates of freedom, a lot of times we have a very bad habit. We burn our bridges before we get to them. 
not after we cross them, before we get to them. We don't reinvent the tire, we reinvent the flat wheel. Did I do that wrong? The wheel, we reinvent the flat tire. See, my tongue isn't working. Tongue is on a strike, not the union. <laughs> when we communicate our ideas, we have so much to share. But it's not ours, we got it from other people, didn't we? And it's everybody's natural heritage to be free. It's their right to be free. And all we're doing is pointing to what's theirs by right. It's like finding that someone has lost a deed to their land that they've been away for a hundred years. They're walking through a valley. And you recognize someone as someone's grandson. You say, is that you? See, yeah, it is. Let me show you something. You see that? They go, what's it to me? It's yours by right. This is your deed. This is your land. By birthright. Freedom is their land by birthright. Freedom is your land by birthright. Bruce Springsteen. I used to watch Bruce Springsteen before he became famous and before anybody considered him chic and before Liz Taylor would even remember his name. Then you got somebody from New Jersey, looks like a penguin with a nose job, can sing up a storm and a jam up guy. One night he was really rocking and he stopped. You guys know Clarence Clemens is? Oh yeah, black guy, he's really cool. Clarence is Clarence invented the word cool. He is really good. Clarence, come on over. He says, I want you to meet my friend Clarence. Clarence is right with the Lord. Clarence is going to tell you a tale about the meaning of life. And Bruce walked over to the side and Clarence walked up. And Clarence said, you know, I don't like to do a lot of talking, so I'm going to let Bruce tell the story. And walked out the direction. So Bruce looked at him and then walked back over the microphone and said, okay, I'll tell the story. And Clarence nodded because he likes to nod a lot. Bruce says, you know, my friend Clarence here is right with the Lord. The other day he was worried. He'd been thinking a lot about life. He'd been wondering what it was all about. You ever wonder what it's all about? You go, you know, what's the point of all this? Is it just you're born, you get a job, you have kids, you die, is that all there is? And it was worrying. It was eating on his heart. And so Clarence was out walking. You know how some people like to walk and think? And he was walking, and it was a dark, rainy day. And it was a dark, rainy day. And the rain had just sort of stopped. And you know how it's got that kind of a wet feeling all around? And he was walking down the street, and there was a cemetery. And he had an inclination to walk into the cemetery. So Clarence turned and walked into the cemetery. Now it's getting to be night. Clarence doesn't like being out at night, and he sure doesn't like being in the cemetery. But Clarence is right with the Lord, so he doesn't have to worry about it because he can walk through the shadow, valley of the shadow of death. He's okay. He's got an end. He's got a spiritual bodyguard. And he was walking past the headstones, and he started walking up the hill. And as he got to walking up the hill, the clouds started rumbling a little. Clarence was wondering, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? And he gets to the top of the hill and he finally says in exasperation, God, what is it all about? What is the meaning of life? Silence. Well, Clarence doesn't mind knocking twice. He said, God, you ain't listening. I ask you, what is the meaning of life? I gotta know. Because it's eating at my heart and I wanna know. And the clouds parted and there was a flash of lightning and bam, thunder. And then he heard the words, let it rock. <laughs> you know, to me, life is like rock and roll. It really is. It's, it's freewheeling, it's free spinning, it's moving. It's choosing our own music. We all got our own music. You might like classical. You might like jazz. You might like rock and roll. You might like uh, soft rock. You might like country and western. I don't know, but everybody's got their own style of music. And the thing I like about rock and roll is it's so imaginative, and it doesn't have any rules. It's sort of like anarchy applied to sound. Anarchy applied to sound. 
and sound except for one thing, for free market energy. And everybody has their opportunity to make their own music in a free world. You can hear melodies to children. You can hear serious noise. You can do boogie. You can do big band. Or you can get out there and do heavy metal and deafen everyone you know. <laughs> <laughs> you can do thoughtful music like Simon and Garfunkel. Or you can do heavy metal and deafen everyone you know. <laughs> you can get out there and do a concert with violins and wonderful orchestration. Or you can do heavy metal and they're already too deaf to know. <laughs> and it's up to you. That's a nice thing. That's part of the M3, is choosing your own music, choosing your other band members. I was thinking yesterday that the nice thing about being able to make your own music, about being able to, to sing your own songs, is that you get to write the words. It's all up to you. That's part of the M3. If you want to sing a love song, it's your love song. If you want to sing something bragging about yourself, you can do, oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble. And that's okay, too. And you get to choose all the people who join your orchestra because it's a free society and it's up to them whether they join. Your family, your friends. And you get to choose your audience. Those are the people you meet all the way through life. The people who give you the appreciation that you're due. Of course it's your due. How do I know that? Because I've met you. Part of being free means being able to make your own music just like that. I was thinking about the future. Here we are in 1986. 1986. We've had the nuclear bomb in the world how many years? 40. 40. 40 years. 40 years. One guy gets a muscle cramp. There was a... Somebody thinks, well, maybe it's the normal. <laughs> Pushes the wrong button. And that could happen. But it's not likely. What's likely is that technology is going to continue to take off and we're going to have a whole new future. But that future is going to be yours and the kind of music you make and the kind of music you make together. You know, that's part of being a supporter of freedom is choosing the kind of world that you want to live in, the kind of music you want to create so the rest of the world can hear. There isn't anyone in this room who can tell me with a straight face that they haven't heard one particular song that doesn't take them back to a feeling and an event where they fell in love, where they lost their first love. You ever have that? You, you lose your first girlfriend or your first boyfriend, and then you hear this sad song. And every time in the rest of your life you hear this sad song, you think of losing that person. Or you remember the first time you went out on a date or the first time you met that person that really was something special in your life? It was like <laughs> Bolero. <laughs> Play it backwards. <laughs> Paul is dead. Uh, it's entirely a matter of remembering. Music does wonderful things to memories. You ever notice how you listen to that one song about the time you fell in love, and it's your song? You remember the time you heard the music, and it just sort of pumped you up, and you're really ready? And you said, boy, I can do just about anything. It doesn't matter what the song was. Could have been classical, could have been country western, could have been something you were playing or humming to yourself. But that music just takes you right on back, doesn't it? It's like a time machine, isn't it? A time machine that takes you back to a different time. Well, we've got a little bit of a time machine that's going to take you form. It's not music, but it's something a little different. It's me. You know I'm a portable time machine? You didn't know that. It's a well-kept secret. I just let it out of the bag now. I want to take you into the future a little bit. The reason I want to take you into the future is because you're going to spend the rest of your life there. That's all there is in the future and now, isn't there? I'd like you to close your eyes and picture this future. 1996, 10 years from now. It's 10 years from now, and you're in London. 
London. No, it's a much nicer city. I like it. It's ten years from now, and you're in London. And the city is about 450,000 people. You've deregulated most of the local government. You've slashed taxes. There are schools everywhere of all kinds teaching in many, many different ways. Some have computers. Some have religious teachers. Some have Montessori. Some have new educational. And children, your children or your grandchildren or your grandchildren, are in these schools. The children are walking along the street, and it's a beautiful street because it's a beautiful, sunshiny day. And the children have smiles on their face because they know they're going to a wonderful adventure, an adventure of the mind. And as they walk along the street, you get a chance to see them. And you remember being that in the street. You remember that hope in your heart once. You remember that light bulb look in the eyes, that potential that glistens. And you can hear the children talking. You know how children talk when they're excited about school? And how they kind of skip and talk to each other? And how they pull aside their special friend and walk with them and share what they're going to do after school and during school? These children are doing this, and you're hearing it. And the kids are saying, boy, <coughs> Coming up. Guess what we get to learn today? Guess what's going on in school today? And they're truly excited about going there. And you see them walk into the school and you smile, remembering some of your school days which weren't quite that good. And you keep walking down the street and you notice that homes have been improved. The homes, instead of, instead of getting worse after years, instead of being weathered, are being improved because they cut taxes so dramatically on homes that people can afford to fix them up. And you look around in the yards and you see newer automobiles. And you see people wearing clothes that are really nice. They can afford that because the taxes are lower. They can afford that because they've freed up the system. And they've deregulated business to the point where City Light Books Incorporated, <laughs> over one billion sold, <laughs> a chain of seven stores locally, uh, the big M, right? <laughs> Golden M. It stands for money. <laughs> and it gets money by catering to ignorance and turning it into learning. And you look around you and you remember the days ten years ago when things looked a little gloomier and you couldn't believe that things would move this rapidly. Because you got involved. Because you packed a little snowball at the top of the hill and gave it a little push. In the first year, the snowball doesn't get very big. It takes a little while to get momentum going. But the snowball got a little bigger and it kept rolling. And as it rolled, it got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger bigger and bigger and bigger. And it got to the bottom of the hill. It didn't cause an avalanche. It caused an absolute beautiful inundation of prosperity. Because that's what a little snowball does when you roll it down the hill and it allows itself to pick up new members, to pick up new help, and pick up new assistance. And every law you deregulate begets another one. And every business that you assist in building itself helps encourage other people. They believe by example that they can do it too. And you started it. And you started it. And you started it. That's the way politics works. It's not a sprint. It's not a short-term game. It's a marathon. It's a 10-year, 12-year, 15-year job to roll, not government back, but liberty in. You didn't work for death and taxes. You worked for life and liberty. And your efforts are what gave those children their smiles and their education, and what gave these people nicer cars and nicer homes and safer streets. Your efforts 
are what freed up the economy enough to the point where you have a part of the Canadian gross national product in your personal name. And that's always good to have. As you move out the door today, you'll be moving toward this future. This future is as certain as I'm standing here because I can see it right here. And I know that's the truth because I only have true hallucinations and true fantasies and true dreams. <clears throat> Lawrence of Arabia had a quote, which I remind you of. He said, we never fear those who dream at night, but those who dream with open eyes during the day, ah, they shall make mighty nations and great things happen. This is what you have right here. This is the beginning. This is the start right now. And you are the beginning. You have a chance, an opportunity to help. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to make an investment in this future. And the investment I would ask you to make is going to be based on what you feel like you can assist the Freedom Party with. I'm not going to ask you to take cash out of your pocket. First of all, I've checked your, your wallets while you're out. <laughs> <laughs> Me and a couple pickpocket friends noticed that you're tapped out. That's understandable. I am too. We blew all of our money on the workshop and on the party over the weekend. Mm -hmm. What I'd like you to do is make a pledge. I'd like you to make a commitment to the Freedom Party. And what I'd like you to pledge is one of two things. Your money or your life. <laughs> Bandits do that all the time, but I'll tell you the truth. Your money is part of your life, and it's a commitment to your life. This is an investment of liberty. I would like you, if you can afford it, to invest 30 cents a day in liberty. 30 cents a day. Good Lord, you'll blow more than that on cigarettes. Shame on you for smoking. You'll blow more than that on a Coke. You'll blow more than that on gasoline getting to and from. 30 cents a day if you can afford it. And there's some of you who are going to say, Michael, is there a limit to how much I can give? <laughs> That's a very good question. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I would like you to put a personal limit on yourself because I don't believe in tapping yourself out totally. I believe that you make an investment. Do you know where tithing originated? Tithing in ancient times was taking 10% of your crop and setting it aside for use in future crops. It was an investment in the future. That's where the idea of tithing came into churches. It was an old custom with farms. 10% of your income is far too much. I wouldn't ask you to do that. If you can't afford a lot, 30 cents a day would be a nice commitment. You could make it on the most debate. That's $10 a month. For freedom, is it worth it? Sure, is it. Your kids worth it? Your grandkids worth it? Sink Street's worth it? A better economy? A place where you can stand tall and breathe free? Is that worth it? Sure. And some of you can afford a dollar a day. A dollar a day? Wouldn't that be a wonderful commitment? Based on what you can get, and I trust your judgment, whatever you feel like, you can invest. This is not a donation. Don't you ever believe that you're giving this money away. This money is as much an investment in your life as your education is, as working here this weekend is, as your job is, as your family is. It's an investment in the children walking down the street and smiling, and the streets they're walking on, and the homes they're walking past. Because they're your homes, and they're your kids and your grandkids, and as you walk in the street, and think of all the enjoyment that will give you simply watching and knowing that you made it happen. Would you hand out envelopes? What I'd like you to do is mark your name, your address, and your postal code, and make an investment based on what you feel like you want to put into the <coughs> If you can afford 30 cents a day, thank you. If you can afford a dollar a day, thank you very much. Base it on your personal situation. And when you're all done with that, I will tell the official gorilla joke. Wait a minute, if they're really big, I promise not to tell the official gorilla joke. Why are you putting
getting the money in there, I, I want to leave with a, a I want to leave you with a few words <laughs> because this has been really important to me. Here's the words I'd like to leave you with. I told you that I really think you're you're nice people, and I'm not just saying that because I'm doing a workshop. I've done workshops, and I swear to you, I have. They had to hold me from getting to the airport. Mary Lou remembers a couple in the U.S. where ungrateful is the kindest word I can say, which means I fail miserably at persuading them to be effective. Some people don't want to succeed. Most people do. You have been exquisite. You've been wonderful this weekend. I, I'm glad I had a chance to meet you. And I'm glad I had a chance to talk with most of you and listen to you. Because every time when he grabs me on my way out, I'm like, I'm going to that. Wait a second, Michael. I'm going to tell you something really important. And he whispered in my ear. And I walk and I'm happy to the bathroom. And I go, wait a minute, that was really good. And I have to walk back and say to the person, thanks, that was really a good insight, and I'll use that. I want to thank you for giving me as much as, as I hope I've given you. And I want you to know one thing about being in the freedom department. And something that if you never remember anything else to say, please remember this. Your whole life, you've learned many different things. You've made some mistakes, you've done many things wrong. One of the things you did right was getting involved here because these are wonderful people and you're one of them. And you're one of them. Being involved in what you're involved in here means one thing and one thing only. Being active in a freedom party means never having to say you're sorry. <laughs> because you did the right thing. Thank you very much for a wonderful evening.
just terrific. I, I, you know, I think of you as friends. I think of you as family. Because when I look at you here, I, you know, I, I look at you, and I look at you, and you, and you, and each and every one of you. Add it all together. That's a big we. That's us. That's Freedom Party. And I'm proud to have you in my family. Thank you.